तो चल स्टार्ट ओके सो गुड मॉर्निंग एवरीवन माय सेल्फ पियर ब्रोतो डायरेक्टर आईडीज एंड टुडे वी आर गोइंग टू स्टार्ट वन अनदर आवर लेक्चर सीरीज दैट इज दिस आवर इलेवेंथ लेक्चर ऑफ ईपीएस थ्री एंड टुडे वी हैव आवर स्पीकर मानवी जादव फ्रॉम यूएसए मानवी इज अ कॉस्मो केमिस्ट एंड अ प्लेनेटरी साइंटिस्ट Uh, her work actually focus on uh, disappearing the origin of stardust or pre solar grains uh, that is found in primitive meteorites that uh, allows us to learn more about the origin of our solar system and other planetary systems she received uh, a bsc and master degree in physics from university of uh, pune that is pune university uh, then she moved to us and received his, uh, her phd in earth and planetary sciences from washington university st louis in 2009 then uh, she did post doc uh, at university of hawaii and uh, chicago uh, she also uh, has a research affiliation uh, with uh, robert a research uh, center for meteorite and polar studies at, uh, at the field uh, museum in national history manvi has a uh, uh, has been a field expedition uh, a member uh, of 2013 to 14 on antarctic uh, by meteorite uh, search uh, for which uh, she received a national uh, science foundation antarctic uh, service medal in 2014 uh, she was a professor uh, of physics uh, at the university of louisiana lafayette uh, since 2018 from where she is about uh, to, to resign and move back to so uh, when marvi is uh, not in teaching actually she is uh, very much interested in in working stem education then several outreach program and uh, so uh, she is a, a part of the nasa's extraterrestrial material analysis group so uh, thanks marvi for accepting our request uh, for guest speaker now the stage is yours you can start your presentation thanks Uh, I hope everyone can hear me um, and see my yes. slides. So, yeah. Uh, so thank you for the introduction, um, Dr. Das, and uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for inviting me to give this talk, and I'm grateful to the rest of you for giving me an hour of your time on a Saturday. So, in this talk, I'm going to give you an introduction to my field of research. Um, Stardust research is a very, very small subfield of laboratory astrophysics. and most people have not heard of it so i'm going to try and keep it fairly basic but feel free to ask me any questions at the end which also includes asking for any kind of clarification of any terms that i have not defined i'm going to try my best to define everything i talk about so i want to start by giving you a quick and uh, and sort of uh, overall picture of what a laboratory astrophysicist astrophysicist such as me does So depending on who you ask uh, I'm also called a cosmochemist but most traditional cosmochemists study material from the solar system while I study the chemical and comp- chemical composition of the universe and its constituents and the processes that produce those compositions so I pretty much use any nano and microanalytical uh, tool available to study pre-solar grains and i essentially study astrophysics with a microscope instead of a telescope so in this day and age um fortunately we don't really have to um wonder about this question that victor hugo uh, put put out and as to which instrument has the grander view uh we live in an age where the advances in both microanalytical techniques and astrophysical instrumentation provides us with the most spectacular views of the universe um and and they uh, and it allows us to study uh the universe in the kind of detail we've never been able to do before so the field is a very uh is a highly interdisciplinary field and i cannot do what i do without contributions from all these fields and these are just a few i constantly tell my research students that there really aren't any boundaries within disciplines anymore we pick a problem that interests us and learn everything it takes to solve the problem okay that's pretty much my philosophy in how i do research and so 
these, like I said, are the different fields that contribute knowledge to uh, my field. Um, okay, so let's start with an introduction. Um, so what are Stardust grains? I'm going to use Stardust and Free Solar grains interchangeably. So um, it, they basically mean the same thing. So status grains are pre gra uh, or pre-solar grains are microscopic dust particles that condensed in the cooling outflows of dying stars such as these, okay? So stars like red giant or asymptotic giant bronze stars, which are basically uh, the, uh, our sun, which, has, which is about to die, and supernovae are very, very heavy uh, mass stars. And these are the most common stars around which these dust grains form, okay? So stardust grains or pre-solar grains did not form in our solar system. That's a very important distinction that you need to remember. And, and so that's why they're called pre-solar, okay? So they are, in fact, what, what you and I and the entire solar system is made from because we are all made from stardust, right? So after the grains are ejected from these stars, they are eventually incorporated into giant molecular clouds such as this one, okay? They then find their way into the solar nebula from which our solar system formed. And then some very refractory grains survived the formation of our solar system. And they remain intact in very, very primitive bodies of the solar system like uh, asteroids and comets. Okay? So when material from such objects are found on Earth, we search for pre-solar grains in them. So, so far, pre-solar grains have been mostly found in primitive meteorites, interplanetary dust particles, and cometary materials, okay? And I've lost my, okay? So I study car carbonaceous or um, carbon-rich grains, and these are separated from the host meteorite by using very harsh chemical dissolution tra treatments. But you can also study these grains in situ in meteorites, but that's not what I do. I separate out pre-solar grains from, um, from meteorites and then, um, and then study them individually, okay? So like I said, I look for pre-solar grains in the most primitive meteorites, and these meteorites are called carbonaceous chondrites. The parent bodies of these meteorites are 4.567 billion years old, uh, which is the same age of our solar system, and these bodies have not been heated above 50 or 60 degrees Celsius, okay? So carbonaceous chondrites with large amounts of matrix matter are the most fertile grounds for searching for status grains, okay? So the Murchison and Orgay meteorites that I've shown here are the two most famous carbonaceous chondrites. So if you're wondering what matrix material is, then take a look at this cross-section of a carbonaceous chondrite um, meteorite called Allende. So the chondrules that are these round um, objects and the CAIs are all solar system condens condensates and, uh, and they're of no interest to us in the stock. But all this fine material that's in between, that's holding all the other components together is what we call the primitive matrix, okay? So some meteorites like Murchison have about 70% 70, 70 by volume of matrix and was the first meteorite from which pre-solar grains were separated. Or gay is a meteorite from which I obtained free solar grains uh, that I study. And this, this meteorite has more than 99% of matrix materials. So basically, you don't have anything else other than just matrix. So it's, it's devoid of any early solar condensates. Okay? And so again, the matrix represents the most primitive material in our solar system. So pre-solar grains were discovered and isolated in 1987 from the Murchison meteorite at the University of Chicago, but uh, by what is commonly called burn the haystack to find the needle method. Basically what they did was they carried out noble gas measurements on acid residues and found large isotopic anomalies in xenon and neon. And these isotopic ratios could only be obtained in natural nuclear reactors and, uh, and that, that, that are available to us, which are basically stars, right? And so over 10 to 20 years, uh, through a lot of trial and error after these anomalies were discovered, they dissolved, the scientists dissolved away the rest of the meteorite till they were left with just the source of the xenon and neon anomalies. So at the end of such a separation, we're just left with a test tube of fine grains, uh, such as this one, 
And these are normally separated by density, or at least uh, graphite grains are separated by density. That's what I study. So museum curators are obviously not very fond of crystalline grain people because we completely destroy the very beautiful rock we get from them. Okay. So we, in general, need a lot more material to separate crystalline grains from. So these are two of my undergraduate students who have worked on separation of crystalline grains from a new meteorite in the last couple of years. And because we work with hydrofluoric acid, they are in full PPE for safety. So Megan was a chemistry undergraduate and Reina was a physics major. And I'm showing you these pictures because I want you to note their different backgrounds, educational backgrounds, but they both get to work in my lab because of the interdisciplinary work that I do, okay? So there are several varieties of pre grains. So and here I've listed the names and uh, the typical grain sizes and the abundances of these grains in the host meteorites. And the grains range from, uh, the, uh, from a couple of nanometers to about 30 microns. Uh, big grains are very rare and are usually aggregates. And so their abundances vary a great deal from nanodiamonds that are a couple of th th uh, thousand parts per million to parts per billion in the host meteorite. So silicon carbide grains are the most widely studied uh, since the discovery of pre grains because they're the most refractory of all the grains and are, they're the easiest to separate out from the host meteorite. Okay, so now we have it. I've, I've told you about how we separate these grains out. Um, I haven't given you the method, but I've so, but now we have individual stardust grains, but how do we tell which ones are pre-solar grains and which ones are solar, right? So the only way to tell the difference is by measuring the isotopic compositions of different elements in the grains. Now, pre grains preserve the original extreme nucleosynthetic isotopic compositions of the stars that they come from, so their parent stars. So here's an example of um, oxygen isotopes uh, measured in hundreds of pre grains. Okay? And so in this um, oxygen 17 to 16 ratio versus uh, oxygen 18 to 16 ratio plot, the dashed lines denote the solar values of the ratios, okay? Notice that the scales are logarithmic, sorry. Um, the scales are logarithmic. So you can see that the oxygen isotopes in the grains vary by orders of magnitude from the solar values. Again, this is the solar values, okay? Then this little red rectangle denotes the variations in oxygen isotopes seen in our solar system materials. So you go anywhere in the solar system, you measure the oxygen uh, composition of those materials, and it's going to plot within this tiny little box, okay? And, but pre grains plot outside of this box, and they denote, um, all, uh, denote the um, nucleosynthetic compositions of the parent stars, okay? So various chemical processes in the solar system can cause some of these deviations, but nothing of the scale that we expect to be taking place in the interiors of the stars. So here's another depiction of the same plot. Uh, this one pl uh, plot plots uh, delta oxygen values, and hopefully some of you know what delta, how to define delta values. So instead of instead of the plane ratios that I showed you, okay. So you're going to see a few of these delta plots again in this talk. So I'm going to explain delta plots here. So such delta plots are commonly used by geochemists and cosmochemists to demonstrate very small variations in isotopic ratios at the per thousand level. So if you look at this expression right here, delta notation is defined as the deviation of an isotopic ratio measured in the unknown sample from the ratio measured in the standard in per mil or per thousand. So a thousand per mil deviation is a hundred percent deviation. Okay. And so dashed lines at zero denote solar or standard values in all my plots. Okay. So again, you can see that the oxygen 17 to 16 and oxygen 18 to 16 isotopic ratios measured in the pre-solar silicates that I show uh, that I show here deviate from the solar ratios from by a very, very large amount. Okay, we call such a deviation an anomaly. And so if you look at the panel on the upper right, right side over here, okay, you can see that meteorites that currently represent everything made in our solar system uh, deviate from the solar ratios by not more than one to 
Okay, so basically, we don't really need to use uh, delta values, but it's tradition, and we've always been using them. So we use delta plots to show pre-solar grain data. But pre-solar grains basically exhibit extreme anomalies not seen in any solar system material. And you can see that the isotopic ratios in the grains deviate from solar values by as much as uh, 3,500%, okay? And such large isotopic anomalies can only be attributed to stellar nucleosynthesis, basically stellar uh, nuclear fusion that happens in stars, okay? So that's how we know pre-solar grains definitely come from stars. So back in 1957, astrophysicists uh, Burbridge, Burbridge, Fowler, and Hoyle wrote a very, very influential paper that is known as the B-squared FH paper. Uh, this paper provided the theoretical understanding of how elements are produced in stars. We had no evidence at that point, but this was just a theoretical study. And here's a depiction, and you don't need to understand what's in it, but it, it, this is a depiction of the various nuclear processes that make heavier elements from hydrogen nuclei, okay? So this paper was responsible for a new field of astrophysics called nuclear astrophysics. And this field explains basically the creation of the elements in the universe through nuclear processes, okay? So the presence of the signatures of these nucleosynthetic pro products in extraterrestrial materials proved without a doubt that all elements heavier than hydrogen and helium were made in stars and was one of the most exciting discoveries towards the end of the last century, okay? And so this is pretty much the main topic of my talk today. So researchers, uh, uh, pre-solar grain researchers, try their very best to obtain as much information as possible from a single grain that's a few microns in size, right? And so there, there are a host of techniques that are used in order to obtain chemical and isotopic information from, from the grains. And I've highlighted the ones that I use routinely, but there are others who use other techniques as well. Now, we use the non-destructive techniques um, first, okay? And so the general protocol is that we use electron microscopy to identify a candidate uh, pre-solar grain. We characterize it with the electron microscope and then use secondary ion mass spectrometry or resonance ion, ion, ion mass spectrometry to measure the isotopic ratios of various elements in each grain, okay? So I will talk a little bit about SIMS, which is secondary ion mass spectrometry and RIMS, which is resonance ionization mass spectrometry, okay? So I mostly study graphites, pre-solar graphites, and uh, compared to the other varieties because they're ideal for multi-element, multi-technique studies, okay? And so these tend to be quite large, as you can see in these pictures, and some of them can be as big as 20 microns. So it's possible to extract a lot more information from these grains because there's a lot of material available. So secondary ion mass spectrometry is the primary workhorse of pre-solar grain studies. And so very simplistically, uh, in this technique, we use a primary ion beam to sputter material off a sample. The ions are collected and separated in a mass spectrometer. And so secondary ion mass spectrometry is used to measure isotopes of elements up to nickel, even that is uh, slightly hard in pre-solar grains, without having to worry about isobaric interferences. So basically elements with the same, uh, isotopes with the same masses. SIMS is highly destructive, mostly because of this sputtering process, right? So when pre-solar grains were discovered, SIMS allowed researchers to measure only like one or two isotopic systems before the entire grain was consumed. Okay, so it was obviously better than nothing at that time, but researchers got ambitious and decided to advocate for a much more efficient and sensitive SIMS instrument. And so the advent of a new SIMS instrument called the NanoSIMS in the late 1990s and early 2000s made measuring multiple isotopic ratios in pre-solar grains very, very easy compared to traditional SIMS instruments, okay? So its design is ideal for pre-solar grain measurements, uh, which basically involves analyzing very, very small samples. It has a very high, uh, I, I shouldn't say very, but it has a high spatial resolution and high mass resolution. And both these can be achieved 
without sacrificing on ion transmission. And, and this is important because of the limited amount of material um, that we have, okay? And so what, what we need to do is it, we should be able to collect and transmit to the detectors as many ions as possible from these small grains, right? And so, and then we have the simultaneous detection of up to seven ionic species, so basically seven isotopes, uh, and, and this increases the efficiency of the measurements by measuring uh, species that originate from the exact same sputtered volume. So depending on the size of a grain, the nanosims can easily measure more than 8 to 10 isotopic ratios in a single grain, which, which makes narrowing the stellar origins of the grains much easier. So I just showed you one method to measure the isotopic compositions of stardust grains. And so I want to show you an example of what we do with these kind of isotopic measurements. So what we do is we try to identify what kind of star that grain came from and the nucleosynthesis reaction that gave rise to that particular isotopic composition. So I've listed all the common stellar sources of, for these grains. And I'm, I'm mostly talking about carbonaceous pre-solar grains. But I'll only talk about grains from uh, supernovae here. And, and so I'm going to show you some isotopic data and how uh, we use it to deduce a stellar source for, for grains. The data I'm going to show you is only for carbonaceous grains, like I said. So an important thing to keep in mind is that these grains condense from the gas phase in stellar environments where carbon to oxygen ratio is greater than one, okay? which is what makes that uh, environment carbon rich. So this image right here shows you the schematic of a massive star. And when I say massive, I mean a star that typically has more than eight solar masses or what's eight times the, solar, the mass of our sun, right? And so this is a star, which is, this is a depiction of a star that is about to go supernova, which is basically it's about to collapse and then explode. So at this end of this star's life, it has synthesized elements up to iron and nickel through nuclear fission, fusion. And the products of various burning phases is what you see in, in each of these layers, right? And so before the star explodes, it has an onion shell-like structure, like the one that, I, that I'm showing you here. And so when it collapses and then explodes, it, ex it ejects all these elements into the interstellar medium. Now, here's a slightly um, um, more uh, detailed uh, figure of what I just showed you. So this figure shows you the most important isotopes that are synthesized in each of these layers. Okay, and these are the most uh, these are the isotopes that we find in uh, are commonly found in pre-solar grains. Now, the regions of interest for carbonaceous grains. Uh, is the helium nitrogen zone right here and the helium carbon zone, these two zones. These are the only two zones that are carbon rich. Okay, so basically the majority of the material that makes our grains needs to come from a carbon rich grain okay, uh, layer. So, and then the rest of these layers are all oxygen rich. Okay, so, and, and now I'm going to show you in the next few slides, we find grains with signatures from the innermost zones, which are oxygen rich, and the outermost zones, okay? So what you're seeing here is a silicon isotopic data plot for status grains. And you see delta silicon 29, which is normalized to silicon 28, versus uh, silicon 30 normalized to silicon 28. So I'm not going to talk about any of the sources of these grains, but all the grains in blue over here have excesses in the isotope silicon 28. Notice that silicon 28 is in the denominator. So all these are grains that have depletions in silicon 29 and silicon 30. So they have an excess in silicon 28, okay? So silicon 28 is made deep with inside a supernova by oxygen fusion reactions and so many, so, so some of the material from this zone needs to be mixed into the grain, but silicon 28 can also be made in other stars, okay? And other stars that uh, have an explosive depth. So how can we be so sure that a grain with a silicon 28 excess comes from a supernova, okay? 
Now notice that the same zone, which makes silicon 28, the zone just below it makes titanium 44, right? And so now titanium 44 is a short-lived radionuclide with a half-life of about 60 years. And this is a nuclear that is only made in supernovae, unlike silicon 28, which is made in other stars as well. So there is no other stellar source that we know of that makes like titanium 44. So the presence of this isotope along with silicon 28 should be a smoking gun for a supernova source for all these grains. So now what we do is if we find a calcium 44 anomaly in our grain, then we infer the amount of titanium 44 that was present in the grain before it all decayed away by measuring that calcium 44, which is the daughter product. And so this plot shows inferred titanium 44 to 48 ratios in the grains and the blue triangle grains with silicon 28 excesses that you saw in the silicon plot also have high titanium 44 to 48 ratios. So notice that there's no solar line for titanium 44 because it's an extinct isotope and thus there's no solar system value, but this is the solar system value for uh, the silicon values, okay? So these are the grains that have high titanium 44 and silicon 28 anomalies. So both silicon 28 and titanium 44 anomalies come from deep inside the supernova. But now remember only the helium nitrogen and helium carbon zones are carbon rich and the remaining are oxygen rich. So the largest contribution to the material that makes up the grain has to, has to come from the carbon rich zones because the grains are carbonaceous, right? So in order to explain the titanium and silicon anomalies seen in the grains, we need to mix material from the different zones. And so what we do is mixing calculations, which I won't really show you, but mixing these, these mixing calculations try to reproduce all the ratios measured in the grains simultaneously, okay? So the main point here is that the grain data requires material from different zones of a supernova to be mixed together after the explosion to make the dust grains we see in the pre-solar grain inventory. So it turns out that the mixing scenario is just not a very, is not a theoretical scenario. It isn't hypothetical and it has been confirmed by astrophysical observations as well. So observations of uh, supernova remnants like this one and this one uh, have indicated that the ejector of the, the stars after they have exploded, they have undergone e extensive mixing and the mixing is very heterogeneous, okay? So these are some of the pictures from X-ray and gamma ray telescopes of Cassiopeia A, which is a supernova remnant. And so the different colors here indicate different elements that were made in this star before it exploded. So notice that this infrared signal from the, from the shroud of dust um, uh, around Cassiopeia A indicates all, that, all those dust grains that are condensing from the ejector of these stars, okay? So when this dust survives and is found in primitive materials in our solar system, we call this presolar dust. Okay, so I just want to say as a caveat, um, mixing is the traditional way to explain the isotopic ratios from supernovae, and it doesn't explain all the anomalies we see in presolar grains. There are some new um, interesting explanations for supernovae uh, grains that are slightly more complicated, which is why I have not included them in this talk, but we still are able to explain anomalies in our grains by um, doing mixing calculations. Okay, so these were supernova grains. And so I'm going to shift gears a little bit and I'm going to talk to you about another technique. And we use this technique to measure isotopes of elements lighter than iron. Okay, that can be measured that and these can, uh, sorry, uh, heavier than iron that cannot be measured with the nanosims. Okay, so all most most of the isotopes that we measure before uh, um, that are lighter than iron and nickel, we can measure them with the sims, but we need another method to measure uh, heavy elements. Okay, and so so we consider in the sims world or the measurement world, we consider everything greater than iron nickel um, uh, 
to be heavy elements. So this other method is called resonance ionization mass spectrometry. And we use this method for measuring heavy element isotopes that are not possible to be measured by the nanosins. And this is because at, at high mass numbers, we are going to run into irresolvable isobaric interferences, okay? So current resonance ionization mass spectrometry instruments push the limit of microanalytical capabilities. There's nothing that comes close to these. Their spatial resolution is can reach up to 10 nanometers, and the expected useful yield is between 40 to 50 percent. And if you compare this useful yield to the 1 percent yield of SIMS and the very low yield of previous generation RIMS instruments, that is Charisma and Sarissa right here, um, these barely got up to 4 to 5 percent, right? So the new generation RIMS instruments are at Lawrence Livermore National Lab in California and University of Chicago. They're called Lion and Chile. And on these instruments, we can measure isotopes of three heavy elements simultaneously by using six lasers at once. And so we're living in very, very exciting times when elements, um, when, when heavy elements can be measured with Lion and Chile um, that, and, and Basically, we've never been able to do these uh, measurements before um, at very small spatial resolutions, okay? So the unique capability of this technique is that it ionizes only one specific element at a time. Basically, because of that, we, we need not have to worry about isobaric interferences from any other elements, right? So one element at a time. So if you want to measure isotopes of molybdenum, we measure only the isotopes of molybdenum, and we don't need to worry about um, interferences from, say, zir zirconium isotopes or any such thing, okay? So here is a picture of the line instrument that my student and I, my PhD student and I use at Lawrence Livermore National Lab in California. On the left is, this, is a laser table with completely homemade laser cavities, and there are six of them here. And then on the right, this is the sample chamber, and this is the time of flight uh, mass spectrometer that sits on top of the instrument, okay? I don't have enough time to explain the details of this instrument, but basically you just have to think that it ionizes only one element at a time, and you don't have to worry about isobaric interferences. So, sorry, okay. So let's talk about heavy elements for a little bit, okay? So we all know the stars make elements up to iron and nickel by fusion, right? And so various neutron capture processes are primarily responsible for making elements heavier than iron in our universe. So the sl slow or S process, which is what I've shown here, and rapid or R process involve capturing neutrons at a rate that's slower or faster than the beta decay rate of unstable elements, okay? So there are other methods like the P process, that's a blanket term for really for how elements that are proton rich and neutron deficient are made. But, we're, but I'm mostly gonna concentrate on neutron capture methods. So what you are looking at here is a portion of the chart of the nucleides where nucleides in the zirconium and molybdenum region are plotted in a plot with proton number right here or atomic number on the Y axis and neutron number on the x-axis, okay? So this is neutron number on the x-axis. Now the thick red arrows show you the main flow of the slow neutron capture process in this region. These thin black lines indicate branches in the S process flow or the minor S process reaction. So basically uh, it branches away from the regular S process part. And so, the solar system or terrestrial isotopic abundances are shown here in percentages for the stable nucleides and room temperature half-lives are indicated for the um, unstable nucleides, okay? So neutron capture cross-sections are also given. So now, if we want to study the heavy element isotopic compositions of stardust and you pick an element, say, mol like molybdenum right here, then we know that 95, 96, 97, 98 are what are called S-process isotopes. So they're made by the S-process by capturing 
neutrons slowly okay and 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 so molybdenum 96 can only be made by the pure s process uh, by by the s process so it's a pure s process isotope and we use its abundance in the grains to normalize our isotopic abundances, okay? So in a stellar environment where neutron densities are conducive to slow neutron capture, then molybdenum 96 is going to be the most abundant while the others will all be depleted compared to molybdenum 96, okay? So now if the neutron density is high enough to be in the rapid neutron capture regime, then we are going to be able to make molybdenum 100 over here, okay? And molybdenum 100 is a pure R process isotope, okay? And so if we, if, if we have a signature of this in our grain, we're going to see an excess in molybdenum 100 and a depletion in all other isotopes, okay? Molybdenum 92 and 94 are P process isotopes, okay? So, Basically, my student here, Ishita Pal, who's my PhD student, and she recently found S process signatures that come from asymptotic giant brown stars or AGB stars. Okay. And and I, I, I won't go into the details like I went into the supernova details, but basically, stars like our sun at the end of their lifetime become asymptotic giant brown stars, right? And so such stars are the major location for the S process, okay? This is how heavy elements are made in asymptotic giant brown stars. And so what you're looking at is a mass plot. And so it has the atomic mass on the X axis, right? And the delta values of molybdenum isotopes normalized to molybdenum 96, okay? And so remember molybdenum 96 was the pure S process isotope. So this is a classic, S process M shaped isotope, okay? Molybdenum 92 and 94, okay, are uh, depleted here. And so are, uh, so is molybdenum 100, okay? And then the other isotopes are depleted compared to molybdenum 96, which is at zero here because we've normalized to 96, okay? So the exact abundances are not important. This M shaped pattern indicates depletions with respect to the S process, only isotope, and that indicates that the grain condensed around a star in which elements were made by the S process, okay? And so asymptotic giant brown stars are the primary source of S process elements in our universe, okay? So studying the S process isotopes in pre-solar grains allows us to provide nucleosynthesis, allows, allows us to provide Nucleosynthesis modelers, so astrophysicists, very tight constraints on things like the physical parameters of the neutron source regions in AGB stars. These neutron source regions are the ones that provide the neutrons for these reactions. Okay, so if there's nothing you take away from my talk today, I want you to remember one thing. So one stardust grain, such as this seven micron graphite grain that you see here, is a snapshot of a parent star at one particular time in its lifetime, okay? So the analytical facilities available to our community right now are so sensitive and so efficient that we can measure so many isotopes on a single grain, and we can still have material left over for analysis, okay? We are talking about analysis on micron-sized grains, and these are the amount of isotopes that we are able to measure, okay? Two decades ago, we were only able to measure, say, like, carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen, and that's it, we would, the grain would be gone, okay? So after, the, the numbers here are not important at all. I just put them there so you can see how many we can measure on one single grain, right? So we take these values to our astrophysicist colleagues, and they try to um, tell us where these anomalies might come from, right? And so these, uh, we, we cosmochemists like to say that isotopes don't lie. And so when we present these, uh, these um, ratios to our theorists, they come up with a valid nucleosynthesis scenario that tells us when in a star's lifetime and what reaction created this star, or this, the, these um, anomalies, right? So 
remote astrophysical observations of stars cannot provide such tight constraints currently, okay? So we basically have a piece of a star in the lab with which modelers can test their calculations and constrain their models, okay? So I'm just gonna quickly tell you about other um, techniques. So I study pre graphite grains and we have two types. The types are not important. What's important is that these are transmission electron images. So basically we've taken a slice of these grains and uh, of each of these individual grains. And we see that these grains have internal refractory carbides. Okay, so these are all very refractory grains. They could be titanium vanadium carbides, molybdenum carbides, zirconium carbides. We could have metallic chunks, okay? And so these could have served as the condensation centers of these, of these grains. So material just condensed around these. So traditionally, the elemental compositions or the trace so, sorry, the trace heavy element compositions that we measure in these in these grains, so like the molybdenum data that I just showed you, actually does not come from the graphite, but it comes from these little tiny subgrains. Okay, and so traditionally we use the TEM to um, to study these grains because and and so that basically involves cutting the grains into in, into uh, transparent slices and then studying them and then putting that picture together to get a picture of what is in the grain, right? So I have been uh, trying to find techniques that are, um, that, are, that are able to give us trace element data much more, uh, easy, much more in a much more easier fashion compared to TEM data. And so, and of course it's, it's a very hard problem, but the reason trace element data is, is, is so important is, and I'm talking about elemental abundances, and not isotopic is because elemental abundances are very easily available from stars, right? Astronomers study um, uh, stars and they're able to measure elemental abundances. And this is, this is uh, data from different stars and they are able to measure elemental abundances very easily. They can't measure isotopic me uh, uh, abundances as easily as we can. So if, if we can measure elemental abundances, then we are able to, um, compare those to what we see in stars directly. We still do it, but it's a very indirect process. And so one of the ways to do this is by nanosynchrotron X-ray fluorescence and tomography. And I'm just gonna show you a uh, um, tomography um, video, which basically is like a CT scan, right? So. In this, you don't have to slice the grain, you don't have to do anything. And this data was taken at um, Argonne National Lab with their hard X-ray nanoprobe beamline. It has a very, very small um, beam size. And basically we don't have to do anything. We just mount the graphite grain on a sharp uh, glass tip and stick it in the machine. And that's what we get, right? So if I hope you can see this video, basically this is a video of a 10 micron grain and you can see what's in the center here right and this is preliminary data so i can't i'm not able to show you so this is the same grain and this is fluorescence concentration and these are the different elements that we can uh, detect in these grains and so the idea is to have this tomography video and superimpose the elemental data on it. And this way we can get a complete picture of what is in the grain, okay? So this is another technique. And so I'm gonna end with uh, why do we study stardust? Um, basically we study stardust on a very basic philosophical level. And that's because it's the starting material of our solar system. It's what you and I are made of. And uh, you all know that we are all stardust. And so by studying these materials, we can obtain a wealth of information on the chemical and physical processes that were active when our solar system was in its birth state, right? Or its nascent stage. So each stardust grain represents a star at a certain time in its evolution before the solar system was made. And the isotopic compositions of the grains allow us to study stellar nuclear synthesis with a precision that's impossible to achieve with uh, astrophysical spectroscopy, okay? We can also learn about how dust condenses in the circumstellar environments. 
And then after this dust is ejected in the interstellar medium, its chemistry and morphology can provide us um, with other information about the processes that are active in the interstellar medium, right? And so basically status grains provide us with a laboratory sample that we can study these interstellar processes with, right? And so as each grain represents one star, an entire database of measurements on thousands of such stars gives us an idea of how the chemistry of our stellar, stellar neighborhood has evolved over time. Okay, and so this is why we study stardust. There are other reasons we can study uh, basic. Uh, we can study early solar system processes, like I said, and that's those are the different the other cosmochemists. But what I do is laboratory astrophysics. Okay, and so these are just a list of all the outstanding questions that at least I'm interested in. There are lots of outstanding questions. Um, about free solar grains, we haven't been able to pinpoint the stellar source of the R process in grains. Um, we haven't found uh, definite sources of um, definite evidence for supernova type 1A or bull ray stars. These are other kinds of stars that make uh, that make dust. But the ultimate goal for free solar grain people is to find absolute ages of grains. So basically, do um, um, radioactive dating, like we do for geological materials, do those on grains. The only problem is these grains are very, very small, and there isn't enough material to um, detect isotopes of, say, uranium, lead, and things like that, which give us absolute ages. But we're still trying to do that. Okay, so I think I sh I will end. I have a few slides, um, and I, that I basically wanted to tell you that this field is a field where we study extraterrestrial samples, right? And so we're bringing back samples from um, missions, from sample return missions. So NASA has been doing that, Japan has been doing that, and hopefully India is going to uh, is going to uh, do a sample return mission in the future. And so it, the future is very, very bright for extraterrestrial sample science, right? And so these, this, this involves a lot of technique studies, a lot of sample handling studies. And so it's, it's something that students should be prepared for for, uh, in, in, at, for the coming generations. So that's pretty much the sample return missions. I'm running out of time. So this is just um, a list of my main collaborators and funding sources. And... And I wanted to tell you that I'm in the middle of making a permanent move to India, and I hope to set up a free solar grain laboratory somewhere. Um, I don't know where yet. So if there are any students who are interested in working with me, please write to me uh, sometime in October or November so we can talk. And this is my email that you can uh, contact me on. So thank you for listening, and I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. Uh, thank you, Manavi, for uh, this excellent uh, talk. Uh, <coughs> so uh, it's, it is good, actually, that you're returning back to India and you're interested to do something for Indians. <laughs> it's, yeah. uh, it will be for, for our country, actually. So uh, it's a good uh, move. But uh, see, what kind of facility you are using in the U.S.? Uh, uh, we are expecting that kind of facility getting in India also. I mean, uh, that, oh, that, a laboratory condition is highly sophisticated instrument you're using. So like I said, the NanoSIMS, which is basically the primary instrument, we have one at uh, the physical research lab, right, in Ahmedabad. Yes. And, um, and hopefully uh, in the future we can get some more in the country. I don't know if that's going to be possible, but at least we have one. And yeah. travel is easy. We can travel to the instrument, get data. And then RIMS, of course. Uh, I have heard that there is a RIMS instrument instrument at BARC, but they basically use that for nuclear forensics. So I don't think they're going to allow us to use it for pre solar grain studies, but RIMS instruments can be built from scratch. And um, and so we can, it, it'll take a long time, but we can always collaborate with um, people in the US and build an instrument in, the, in, in India. And Otherwise, there's always you can always travel for measurements, which is what I do. Uh, my student and I travel to California for measurements. We don't have the instrument in hmm. uh, in the university where we are. So, 
Okay, nice. So I have a few uh, basic questions. Uh, sure. So uh, first, uh, <coughs> I'd like to know that what kind of you know, what type of copyright you most prefer to uh, to get this uh, free solar games means. I see we know all various types of right for meteorites, uh, chondrite, then uh, some Martian meteorite also, lunar meteorite also, or different asteroid. So what kind of meteorite you basically So use? Uh, uh, we basically need meteorites that are very primitive. So CIs or CMs, yes. so carbonaceous chondrites, uh, these have, they might have some aqueous alteration, but they have not been thermally metamorphosed at all. So CI is, uh, is a meteorite like Orge, which is basically 99% matrix. And then uh, Murchison is a CM type, which is where the first pre solar grains were found. So we can find meteorites and other carbonaceous chondrites, but these are the most um, uh, uh, common ones where we, we are able to find a large number of meteorites. So um, other, other uh, meteorites like that, are com that come from differentiated bodies, you've destroyed everything that is that is a signature yeah. from the early solar system right you also involved in uh, antarctica missions right you have collected yes. samples from the yes this is a picture of uh, a carbonaceous chondrite that i collected uh, that that we collected in antarctica when i was there um so you can see how how um mm. it, it basically is just like a that like a coal like coal yeah. it's just like a uh, material that has nothing else from the early solar system. It's just a chunk of coal that is carbonaceous. And that's, that's, we're pretty sure. And I checked if this was classified as a carbonaceous chondrite and it was. But how, how do you uh, that, uh, identify this material? Right? Because it's very much similar to our common earth rocks. Yeah, how you can distinguish right. it? So that's the best part about going to Antarctica is you go out on ice fields. There's nothing else other than glaciers. And so anything that's on the surface is pretty much uh, something that fell from the sky. Oh. Right? It's, that's why it's the easiest. Of course, there are mountains in Antarctica. And so if you are close by, close to mountain ranges, then we have to distinguish between, um, between the uh, rocks from the mountain and the rocks from, uh, from, uh, from space. But one way to um, tell meteorites uh, meteorites from regular rocks is from the, by the presence of fusion crust so there's a thin layer um, melt layer that's on each mm. rock which is which is what forms when it goes through the atmosphere right and so and so that's one way to tell a meteorite from the regular rock but it requires a little bit of training to know what kind of rocks are there in the in the vicinity from that from that region and 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 knowing what meteorites look like. But there is a chance that we miss some. Uh, but if you're just out on the ice, the only thing on the surface is our meteorites. There's nothing else because there's nothing else around it. And sometimes you can see a tiny little meteorite at a distance of, say, um, um, 50 meters. You can, you can spot it because of the high contrast. Mm. Yeah, and also some uh, I heard that uh, can separate a meteorite grain from the core sample also. Some sometimes they are drilling that. Uh, yeah, yeah, ice yeah. Core. yeah. And the yeah. ice core also uh, separate some uh, the meteorite grain. That, right. <coughs> and, uh, okay, so, so uh, these are now, the ones that have sunk inside the ice over time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, in India, NIO have this facility. I have heard they are right. doing this. Uh, don't they? Don't they take? Uh, don't they um, look for? Um, they look for micrometeorites at on, on the right mm. from the ocean floor, right? That's what they collect. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Okay, so now it's right time to take a few questions from the audience. Uh, so, Mr. Uh, Rabiu uh, Muhammad. Uh, he asked one question that it, uh, is it only the, the the mission samples are needed uh, for such analysis? Secondly, can we be use the meteorite fall samples that are falling every day? Thank you. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, I'm sorry, I had to rush through what I showed about mission return samples, but no mission. So the reason I mentioned the mission return sample is because the missions that currently went so like this one. Uh, that that went to Osir uh, to asteroid Bennu. These are 
cons uh, Bennu was, is considered to be a very, very primitive uh, asteroid. And so this is the kind of meteor, uh, this is the kind of material we expect in carbonaceous chondrites that fall to Earth. So that's why we're interested in the mission uh, return, uh, sample return missions. But no, it's not at all necessary to wait for these missions. Obviously, this is an extremely expensive um, um, uh, endeavor. And mostly because you're, what we're going to get back is a very, very small amount of material. But we can definitely use the meteorites that fall to Earth, um, um, fall to Earth commonly, I shouldn't say um, very often, because carbonaceous chondrites are fairly rare. But yes, we can use the ones that fall to Earth. Um, and we and um, meteor, uh, finding like the expeditions like Ansmith expeditions are considered to be the poor person's space mission because we can find meteorites on Earth and we don't have to go anywhere to collect them. So so no, we so definitely we can use um, the uh, the meteorites that fall to Earth to study these kind of samples. Mission return is just a is is just something that we're looking forward to in the future. Okay, the second uh, question is uh, from Mahmoud Saibaj Khan. What is RPI process? Do this also include capture oh. of proton? Right. So uh, proton capture is not a very um, um, is 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 it's it's basically a P process is basically a term we use for proton enriched nuclei. So basically that are neutron deficient, deficit and proton enriched. So there are various other various ways to make them. One is photo disintegration and other very exotic reactions, but that's P process. Um, and then we have S I told you was the slow capture. R is the rapid capture. So rapid in terms of the beta decay rate. So before you beta decay, if you capture a neutron, you're going to move up the chart of the nuclide. So you're going to move to the right and make heavier elements. So, uh, so I told you about the uh, um, molybdenum 100. So that is an R process isotope. So that is rapid capture. And I process is basically in between slow and um, rapid. Okay, it's a it's a new process that we found in uh, pre-solar grains. We are we are studying it. Uh, currently, and we we hope to write a few papers soon, but um, but it's basically nu neutron fluxes that are in between slow and rapid. So that's what I stands for. So um, I have another funny question. Uh, it is yeah. uh, uh, the origin of diamond. You told that uh, get some diamond on uh, meteorite sample. These diamonds are how the diamonds actually form. Are they similar uh, process that we have found in Earth? Uh, that said process wise, is that say similar or they're different? I, 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 we don't know actually. So nano diamonds are are very very abundant, but mm. we think it might be due to shock processes. Mm. Okay, so shock waves that travel through the interstellar medium. But basically, because nano diamonds are uh, so small, they are one to two nan nanometers. We can't study individual grains yet. So we have been we've used uh, methods like uh, atomic force microscopy to measure um, isotopes, but we still are not capable of measuring nano diamonds for at the individual pre-solar grain uh, individual grain level, and so. Nano diamonds actually are a big mystery, and so one of the um, uh, methods I've heard that you can make nano diamonds is through shock processes. But I don't know, I I don't recall of any other new um, method to make that. But we don't know much about nano diamonds at all, mostly because of their small sizes. Okay, the next question is from Shivani. Why do we get lithium barium boron in less abundant in solar system what is the actual reason and okay, what is so it used for that's that's a great uh, question uh, so lithium beryllium and boron are um, destroyed in stars right and so basically to go from helium to carbon nitrogen oxygen 
we are uh, we need to destroy lithium beryllium and boron and so that that is reflected in the solar system abundances and because we are basically made of stardust material right so but we do find lithium beryllium boron by other methods that are not from stellar sources we we can find them from cross uh, from cosmic ray spallation and other 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 ways of making these isotopes Okay, the final question is from uh, Samia Khan. Uh, she asked her, as a question, S process do not deal with carbon to nitrogen decay? Question. So, so I, 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 I'm not sure what the, so S process is a way to make heavy elements. So uh, you can make carbon and nitrogen just by fusion. Okay, so you don't need neutrons to make carbon and nitrogen. So um, uh, carbon and nitrogen isotopes are all made by the fusion process. We use S process and R process explanations for heavy elements that cannot be made by fusion because fusion stops at uh, iron and nickel. And so we don't really, carbon and nitrogen can be easily made by fusion, basically. Okay, I think that's all from the audience. And uh, <laughs> and uh, what is your suggestion for the new uh, newbies who want is interested to work on this field? Uh, how they develop their uh, what kind of study? So you can. So I have students, right? For, I have geology students. My 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 PhD student is a geologist. Um, I have chemistry students. I have physics students. I think you just need a you you just need a good uh, um quantitative um, analytical background, which basically any science, any good science program will give you. And I, and of course, to study the astrophysics, you need to have some kind of astrophysics background, but you can always pick that up. My, my uh, PhD student uh, had no astrophysics background and she now works on S process, R process, and uh, she picked it up. And so I think any science, uh, any good STEM background, um, compu co uh, computational um, abilities are good. So always build up your computational abilities and um, and then you can learn the analytical capabilities on, on the go. So. Thanks, Manabi. Uh, uh, <laughs> any other questions from the audience? If you are interested, you can raise your hand. You can see the small uh, hand option in your screen and uh, we'll unmute yourself you and can ask questions uh, just to wait for one no no i think it's <laughs> done so thanks thanks for uh, your beautiful lecture one week uh, you're most welcome <laughs> i hope in future also we'll get your suggestions and advice uh, sure. time frame. And uh, if someone uh, would be interested uh, <clears throat> to learn more about this subject, I definitely forward to you. Okay. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, thank thanks. You. Thanks. Thank you, everyone.